And, Hello, everybody. And live. Uh, welcome to this very special Thanksgiving, or actually Black Friday edition of Attention Span Labs. Okay, so we are today going to talk about Appendix I, and I'm gonna we're gonna let everybody here, uh, all of our other panelists, introduce themselves. But the uh, the Appendix I is a is a new project founded by several two of our guests here, and uh, it's what we're we're focused on is restoring the cultural context of Western civilization that we've lost, and that uh, modern modern entertainment media is is openly hostile to. So I, as usual, I'm, I'm author Mike DiBaggio, and uh, we're going to go around the table and introduce our guest. Judd, why don't you start? Um, I'm Judd. Uh, I've been a gamer since I was 12, which is 30-something well, years now. So, uh, and a uh, big pulp fan, uh, consuming a lot of movies. Uh, used to be my team trivia's ringer for, for movie trivia, so... Um, yeah, I'm very interested in pop culture, and you know, I come at it from a, you know, an '80s kid of the '80s perspective. So uh, I didn't realize how lucky I was. Uh, uh, I was there during, you know, sort of the heyday of, of things making sense. Um, and uh, I'm I, the person that pulled the trigger on the MeWe group for uh, Appendix I. So um, I am here to, to speak about it. And thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, Joe, you want to go next? Sure, yeah. Joe Schmo from the southern part of the United States. I'm a huge fan of pop culture, and I think Judd and I were the ones discussing this on MeWe, in fact. And uh, we thought that it'd be great to create something where we could push people towards the good that's being created in support of the West. I'm a family man. I'm thankful for many things this Thanksgiving season, and thankful for my country, thankful for my family, and certainly thankful for the world that we live in. And I'd like to bring some attention and some awareness to the things that are assailing those values that we hold dear. Uh, other than that, I'm just an asshole, so there's that. <laughs> and there goes our YouTube shadow ban. Oh. Goodbye. Uh, Imperian Vol, do you want to go next? Hi there, yes. Uh, I'm uh, Imperian Vol. You also, some people might know me as Peter, which is my real name. I guess I'm representing comic books in a way. I'm also a big uh, role-playing gamer fan, uh, Pulp Fiction fan. Um, have been somewhat involved in a lot of those different things, and uh, very glad to be here. Um, we have a comic book anthology series that our Discord club kind of puts out, and it is a, um, we say PG-13, but it is a, a comic book series that's um, something that anybody could get into that kind of embraces comics from uh, a traditional point of view. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, and I, I'm uh, author Michael A. DiBaggio, and you, you probably know that my wife, uh, Shell Presto, usually joins us as well. And we're an author artist team. Um, we are Christians. We are pro Western, and we are uh, uh, perhaps more importantly to to, to most in, uh, than any of that, we're we believe in in telling stories that actually entertain rather than are about uh, driving driving a a a left-wing, you know, um, anti-cultural agenda. So we're, um, that, that's why I wanted to give this, this group, we're all, we're all members of the group on MeWe. So if you, if you'd like to join us, first of all, on MeWe, uh, the, the name of the group is Appendix I. It's a group that you have to apply to join, but it's mainly to get, uh, to keep the, the, the advertising and porn bots out of there. Um, so feel free to look us up on there. And, um, I also want, want to thank that uh, many of the members of the group and our other other friends that ha have joined us on on the live chat. So to say hi to Ardenon Studios, hi to Shell Presto, and hi to Carlos Carrasco. Carlos Carrasco. And is there if there's anybody else on there um, that I missed, then hello to you as well. Okay, so let's let's get right into it. Why don't um, Judd and Joe, uh, you guys founded the group, so I I want you to tell us. Um, what what is appendix i what is the problem that we're trying to solve and uh why why is it needed why is it important right now well, no, it's, quick. It, oh yeah go judd, ahead Joe. judd you get the credit on this one i was just throwing ideas out there okay. we synced up pretty good 
Yeah, the, the idea of Appendix I is sort of to light a candle rather than curse the darkness. Um, I, I don't think it's any huge surprise to anybody or, or a shock to anybody to hear that, you know, popular culture and media and whatnot are, are sort of swirling away from very traditional values and there's a lot of deconstruction and postmodernism and and a lot of ideas that are centered around taking you know what used to be sacred and kind of tipping those cows uh, for no other reason than to just sort of show that that they're not any more special than anything else and I, and I think that we're starting to see from the results of their product the people that feel this way really don't have a better cow to offer and so the idea of appendix i is to allow us to share with each other primarily uh currently active creators that are um that are producing things that are in keeping with traditional values and and are not infected with this sort of deconstructive uh, deconstructionist or postmodern viewpoint and uh you know to also share kind of traditional inspirational materials uh you know the, the sort of uh, i guess what you call the western canon but but even into the pop cultural canon uh you, you know uh, public domain things uh, as well as you know things that are still within the umbrella of copyright but were produced by uh, uh people respectful of those traditions so it's 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 a way of sharing information and you know uh the <laughs> the wisdom of the crowd i suppose to to let people know that there are are alternatives to this you know guttering uh, pop culture that we're that we're being presented with now yeah, Judd is absolutely right on that. He has a great perspective on that. When this came up, the uh, the thread that kind of threw this all into the works was how we were discussing how we need to cherish the values and the truths that made us great in the West. Now, I am a fan of the West, and I believe the West is an amazing culture and uh, civilization. You know, when you think of it in total, it's brought so much good to the world. But that's under assault, and there are a couple of actors that are trying to undermine that, I believe. But just because I think the West is amazing doesn't mean I don't think the rest of the world is too. So I think the whole world has so much value to bring to the conversation. But if we don't show our pride and, and learn the lessons and relearn the lessons that we learned before, it's gonna spin out of control. We'll lose our, our identity, we'll lose what made us great. Things like liberty, pursuit of happiness, etc. And that's kind of what I hope we will learn to keep close to us. We will learn to preserve because the world out there is just quagmire, chaos, if we just let it go. We have no grounding. We have no perspective from which to learn, understand, and challenge the world and make it a better place. Uh, for, for certain, there is a lot of common cultural touchstones throughout every culture, every, every branch of humanity. Um, but uh, to, to segue into our, the, the first topic here, one, one thing that seems to me is that the, the modern entertainment... Uh, that is being produced largely by by advanced corporate interests who are, are for the most part uh, rolling rolling on on the inertia of of great creative works that were created some uh, at least a generation ago, sometimes you know a hundred years ago or more, um, and that they're in increasingly uh, unrooted from from any of this. And the, the stuff they're they're putting out now doesn't seem to have any. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have any touchstones whatsoever to anything that, that people value, that, that people traditionally have found um, important or perhaps most important, even entertaining. And, and so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, and if, if you agree or if you disagree, let me know. But uh, why, why is modern corporate entertainment so hostile to its, its, its the audiences that made it rich? um to 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 western values to christianity uh and even even to to telling a story that people care about what do you think that is i think some of it has to do with the fact that that, that they're looking to expand their brands and somewhere along the line they got the impression that 
the old guard is the old guard, so it will stay, it will stand its post regardless of what happens. And so we'll always have these guys and these gals, you know, because they they stick, you know, they're fans thick and thin, right? And and you know, letter writing campaigns, et cetera. And so they think if we go looking in other directions or if we start tailoring the message to, you know, uh, other audiences, we're going to have all of those folks and all these new folks too. And I think there's just, there's just any general zeitgeist among creatives of, of picking up these postmodernist ideas. And, and after a while you get the idea that every story has been told, right? And so they, they want to, the idea of deconstruction came of by saying, you know, these stories are archetypical and, and that's a construct and it's, and it's, you know, it's part of a hierarchy and that's an unreal thing. So if we're going to tear that down to show that it's just one of many possibilities, you know, the, the idea that there's a, uh, an infinite number of monkeys pounding on a on a typewriter would produce Shakespeare, but it but it also produces much more garbage. You know, They're, it only produces Shakespeare once, and all of that. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. Is that they think that that they can have their cake and eat it too, and they've just been fed this. So more and more, as as the generation, you know, the next generations are picking up. The, the reins they've been taught this their whole lives you know they they don't have a a better example and they've been told repeatedly one of the previous example is no good and you know so of course they're not going to start from that grounding i'm there I'm are gonna, so good go, you go ahead joe okay there are so many there are so many reasons why this might be the case why say modern or corporate the corporate America, corporate Hollywood, couldn't create a good story if they tried. And as Jed was mentioning, you know, there's a lot of this, 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 this sort of pandering that the old has been done so many times that you can't possibly do anything special or interesting or, or you can't capture someone's attention anymore. I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're unmoored from their cultural heritage and they don't understand the context in which those stories were told in the first place. You can't tell me that the story of say like a fun a, like a father saving his son isn't riveting and important you can't tell me that say the stories inspired by our ancient heritage won't always be immortal and eternal truths that will always draw an audience no matter what they can't help it that's why we have all these superhero movies people talk about this all the time what is the story of thor you know it's a u-shaped story it's built off of a familiar pattern to us but it's never going to get old the problem is they don't believe in those things anymore and i think that they have this goal their goal is built on this progressive slash utopian vision of the future. What they want to do is they want to tear down the old to build the new. And we've seen this pattern a few times as well. And it, it draws out of a tradition that is sort of recent, but it's anti-enlightenment, it's anti-Western. And they expect it once it's torn down everything else, once it's subverted all the visions we have for a good story, to create something new, useful, and inspirational to start the revolution. Let's be honest, that's kind of where it's going. That's how I see it. Now, the, the problem here is that it's built on an illusion and a poor understanding of human nature. I think it's kind of blank slateism, but human nature is not blank. Hold on a second. <laughs> that's how I see it, and that's why I see it as stale and ineffectual. All right, that's it. So I, I, I will throw out the idea that I don't think um, the audience... I don't think they're actually trying to appeal to a new audience so much as they're trying to create an audience. I think that, um, and, and I, I would argue that this is supported by the, say the, 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 the very poor reception of say the new star Wars movies of, of modern Marvel comics, modern, modern, um, any, any kind of, any kind of, um, uh, mainstream produced comic books that they're doing what, uh, Dave Stewart, um, one of uh, a, an author and YouTuber that I follow calls Bolshevik marketing that they have this, uh, they're, you know, he uses the example of the Rose Tico action figure that they produced huge, huge amounts of uh, for the last Jedi. And uh, they were like, you, you know, 
you are gonna you are gonna love Rose Tico. Why? Like nobody likes Rose Tico, and they 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 saw the movie just just like that. Another another example from the same Star Wars movie would be Captain Phasma. Like they they talked up this this big yeah. character, and they made this this Mary Sue that was was a complete uh, disaster on screen. Nobody like nobody was interested in in either of these characters, and yet they pushed them uh, because the 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 and you could you could talk about the the new Captain Mar or, um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe Captain Marvel, um, and and people aren't actually people don't actually care about these characters, but yet they they are they are insistent that they are the new thing. They are what everybody likes. They're what everybody needs to to tap into, and they're yeah. Um, and and yet they're they they they're thwarted in this time and time again. But they're um they they don't seem to care and and uh, uh i think we've gone beyond the the point in time where you can argue well they're just chasing money because very obviously now we can see with the failure of star wars and, and other other uh properties that at one point made you know we're, we're, we're basically a license to print money and they've they've ruined that but they're 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 doubling down and tripling down yeah they're, they're not making any money <laughs> that's the thing yeah so it, so it's a pretty. It's interesting, you know. Captain, uh, is it Captain Phasma? Uh, yeah, definitely. She ended up where she belonged, though. Yeah. Yes, she ended up in the dumpster. <laughs> Let me just say that I am shocked to hear that she was on screen. She's in like the sum total of it for like what two minutes. She gets jobbed almost immediately. Yeah. I don't think they ever established that she ever did anything. And one could argue that that is also true of Boba Fett. Yeah. But Boba yeah. Fett was in our hearts long before he was on the screen. <laughs> yeah. So I think they it's it's strange because these are people largely raised on the Internet and they didn't figure out that you can't force a meme. Like it's yeah. never happened ever. You know, you, you don't know what's going to hit and you can't make something hit. I, I think there's some gaslighting going on, too, because like I have this friend at work and I, I, I kind of use this guy because – this guy has nothing but dumb opinions, right? So I always ask him, <laughs> like, I ask him about comic books. You know, he's like, you know, I, because I, I'm a comic book guy, and he's he's like, oh yeah, I like comic books. So what do you like? He's like, I used to read X Men. He's like, you know, so you don't read any comic books now? And I'm like, no, no, no. What do you think of this uh, Captain Marvel thing? He's like, everybody loves Captain Marvel. And I'm like, do you <laughs> like Captain Marvel? No, I, I, it's not for me, obviously. Do you know anybody who likes Captain Marvel? I've just read this article. Everybody likes Captain Marvel, but do you know anybody? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody well, likes Captain. Marvel. When I when I got into comics, um, the earliest, you know, when I was four in like 1987, and I was reading GI Joe issues, um, you know, there there was there there Marvel didn't put out press releases that were carried by uh, NBC and CNN. Today they they put them out and they're you know of course because they're owned by Walt Disney Corporation and everything else but yeah. they're, they're 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 just they're pimping these stories and, and laying down this they're they're laying the groundwork for this narrative and the narrative is that everybody 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 cares about this everybody's excited about about Captain Marvel everybody's excited about the the fourteenth iteration of Civil War Infinity Gauntlet whatever um, and uh, they they're they're trying to manufacture popularity yeah. um it, instead of, and and in and not not in a way of building off of something that they know it's they're, not organic yeah it's not organic at all no well, i think that i think that the i think you hit the, the nail on the head before it's not about popularity we talked about this it's, it's about the movement it's about changing the world it's about changing the world in the way that you want it without any regard for the way that it is now or or the way that people have cherished it for time yeah, it's, it's insane. It's not the same thing anymore. They're looking at something else. They have a different vision. And that's why popularity is not important. What's important is penetration, I guess. Well, you know, that's, why like they, a, that's why they reuse characters, too. They don't, They could be making their own characters. They could be making a, I don't know. A, oh, no, could, they couldn't. Oh, no, right. they couldn't. That's <laughs> right. They, they want, can't. They thought they, they would like to if they could, but they don't have creative power. And that's yeah. the issue because their creations don't rely on archetypes and human nature. They end up with this these weird Franken creatures like safe space and snowflake and all that crap right i'm showing, yeah, I'm showing a comment right now on the screen from art and on studios it says with the unmooring the creative process of hollywood is circumscribed by things that are forbidden in their worldview fewer things are allowed with every year and creativity is circumscribed and i think that's it very accurately describes 
what we're seeing now is that even when 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 I thought, oh wow, SJ, SJWs have have very obviously taken over the the comic industry. I thought this back in 2011, um, but I noticed that other people don't seem to have have uh, many of the commentators that are famous for it now on YouTube didn't even become aware of it seemingly until about 20, 2016. And, and it, it's just the, 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 the tolerance or what, what could more accurately be described as the intolerance ha, has, has grown and every year. Um, everything they put out is, is, is more and more identical uh, to mm-hmm. not, and not just to like regurgitations of the old stuff, which they were sort of all doing for a long time, but there it, it's identical to everything else out there. And, and there, there's a, a, a very narrow range of acceptable opinion and that that range narrows a little bit more every day that yeah, was a really interesting question or comment that just came up because i i came prepared to discuss to discuss the origins of political correctness and that's exactly what that is political correctness is something that popped up probably in the 30s i think that it has a link to the old soviet motto that something may not be factually true but it's politically true and that's important Political truth or political correctness, politically correct, is really important because it dis- it defines the argument. It defines the world. And this is tied into this this movement that's o- overtaken all art, all cinema, all books, comic books, everything. The point is to say, this is forbidden. You can't speak about this. This is okay, but you have to speak about it in this way. Here are your new values. Here's your new state of being. Here's your new world. It describes what is left and right in terms of what is ac- acceptable and unacceptable to change the entire conversation, and that's where it kind of came from. It's a, it's a it's a nutty rabbit hole to go down, but PC itself is part of the problem. It describes a huge portion of the problem. Yeah, I I think what Hollywood has missed, the, or the the latest attempts, not just of Hollywood but in pop culture, is they've sort of missed that the killer app of Western culture for storytelling and whatnot is the hero's journey, and the hero's journey is about a person who is part of your culture and he's he's a he or she is a distillation of of the culture they grew up in and they're imperfect and they go out into the unknown and they face some horrible thing that is that is threatening themselves and their culture you know in 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 at least theory and they learn something about themselves they become stronger they defeat the thing and then what they come back with makes the whole culture better because that's how cultures win is they go out, they find new things, they incorporate them, you know, they, they expand themselves. And the problem now is that they're so identitarian that, that no hero they create ever embodies the culture they come from. It embodies a portion of the culture they come from. And the threat that they go into is the other part of the culture. And so it's it every story that they will ever tell is a civil war story. You know, it's it's there's never an outside threat. The threat is always your neighbor. And yeah. and that that only resonates with half the people that will see it, if you're lucky, right? Like sometimes a far fewer, you know, if you depending on how you construct that uh, us versus them mentality. And the 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 hero's journey is the us is us. It's it's all people, you know, and the them is the things that threaten people, monsters, the darkness, the unknown, you know, uh, the dragon out there with the treasure. And and when the hero wins, they're winning for everyone. You know, everyone that could read the story roots for the hero because mm-hmm. the hero is them and their construction. The hero is only occasionally you. And you may not agree with them. And you may find yourself agreeing with the villain. How many people were rooting for Thanos <laughs> in, in the end game movies? You know? and, yeah. and it gets disjointed very quickly. And so you, you have to, uh, we got in love with the idea of understanding the villain at some mm. point. And but I blame and, Alan Moore for that. I think that uh, that became cool. And then it became ridiculous with everyone trying to copy him. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it may have, yeah, I, I don't know, yeah. And it, it poisoned every well, like every, not just comics, it's every well. It's poisoned with the, the deconstruction thing. You're, you're absolutely right. But, and, and, and quite frankly, with Thanos, I go, well, you know, he's an environmentalist. He's a homeowner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So he's the heck of a father. There's a there's <laughs> he's a dad. I there's a deeper that. aspect to that actually because when you look at the tradition of literature even john milton talked about the devil bash mm -hmm. the devil stood and saw off because you know saw, saw how awful goodness is as was quoted in the crow the villain has always been more sympathetic in some regards because all of us have that fallen aspect to us but the problem is if you if you try to normalize the monster on the outside to make him cute cuddly you know you dilute the, the power of goodness itself and that's kind of where you're looking at the fallen heroes and, and the rising of villains. It's all over comic books. Yeah, and well, and usually too, the oh, hero, yeah. the hero is in love with their own ideas to begin with, and then they learn that their culture's ideas are are, are in some ways better or more informative. And the villain is in love with their own ideas and stays in love with their own ideas until they're defeated. And, usually. And, that's been done well with, like, let's say the screw tape letters, you know, C.S. Lewis uh, could, but, you know, but it's very clear that there is, you know, there's this side and then there's that side with C.S. Lewis, you know, um, or uh, the devil and Daniel Webster or, you know, any of the the various uh, great pieces of literature that, that were able to do that. Uh, you're not supposed to identify with the bad guys. Yeah, I, I think screw tape works so well because you can identify with a, a dude who has a crappy job that he hates. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I, I think that the the woke crowd, whatever whatever other names you you want to want to give them, is is inevitably going to resist telling any kind of story um, that is is um, is introspective. Uh, uh, or has any sort of thing to do with like the the, the common the commonality of 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 human faults and human failings and human struggle because uh, in their mindset um, good was just invented last week and it's whatever they believe and there is there is no struggle they are they are the end result of 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 moral reasoning and, and they're that they're completely ignorant of the rest of human history of, of philosophy of, of religion um, doesn't, doesn't bother them at all because they, they already know in their minds, everything there already is to know about it. And it was all bad. So the, the idea there, they can sympathize with, to, to their mind, there is not really any such thing as, as a villain uh, unless it, unless it's someone who, who disagrees with their, their, their way that they're going to order or reorder the world. To, to bring about their utopia, to bring about the way things ought to be, to to repair uh, ancient grievances, and so in that respect, they it, in from the classical formulation of these stories, they are the villain. Like in from from everybody else's perspective, they take the role of the villain. They don't see themselves that way, and as as Judd said a few minutes ago, you know the the, the villain never accepts that um, the things they're they're doing is bad. They they have the, they they don't have a change. They're 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 set in uh, that they already know they're right and they know they're going to they're going to do do what it, whatever it takes. Um, they they don't have that that growth that maturity to come out of that. And and the the other so so that's one reason I think that they that they the, the villain appeals to them. Uh, the other other is is simply that uh, they don't believe uh, in general. It, it's become passe to talk about. Uh, such a thing as as uh, objective truth and objective objective morality uh, things that are that everybody can agree are are right and wrong mm -hmm. um, they it, it, it all has to, there's there's a you know a cultural angle to it and and the things that um, that everybody takes for granted are in fact uh, an expression of of uh, white supremacy of Christian supremacy what whatever and and that you know we're not we're not, uh, you know, cons considering the equally valid, in in their in their eyes, equally valid perspective of people saying that you know, hey, e eating other humans is totally okay, or uh, cultural or, relativism, yeah, cultural right, relativism. Yeah. Well, the villain in all of their stories is judgment, right? Like the hero's right. journey for them is hero is already good, no one sees that. Hero does some things. Everyone sees that they're okay without them ever having change. Right. It is vital in their story that the that the protagonist not change 
and that the world changes to see that the protagonist is worthy as opposed to the traditional story of hero you know is 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 not a really you know sort of sort of a lump of, of un, uh, unshaped marble goes out into the world and faces those judgments and uses that to become you know a, a more sculpted uh, uh, cultural artifact so to speak Jed, Jed I, I think that that's that's really hitting the nail on the head the the issue with the woke perspective is that the, the, the source of great evil, like you said, judgment, the source of great evil is really a structural problem. So the structures in the world, the structures that society has created, the structure of, say, white supremacy or whatever, patriarchy, those are all structural issues. And anybody that is affiliated with those structures is a villain as well. And you were talking about personal development. So the hero in the traditional journey develops as a character. Now, if you're perfect to begin with, like Captain Marvel, for instance, you can't go any higher. You have to fight the problems on the outside because that's where the problem is and that's where the patriarchy is or wherever it might be, any particular external force. You have to destroy the structures. Yeah. It's part of a revolutionary mindset. They don't actually fight anything, though. The, if you look at these characters that they've come up with, um, there's uh, nothing happens usually in any of these stories they're afraid of offending somebody if i if they have them you know punch a character it's got to be uh an absolute character of whatever everybody agrees can be punched uh if it's anything else they're not allowed to do it and they do devour each other on a regular basis you might be up this year the same guy that stuffed uh you remember the the big controversy the women in fridge fridges the yep. uh the gail simone controversy the core controversy uh is a guy that also uh goes around now super woke <laughs> like that guy and he's like yeah you guys thought you could do this to comics you know <laughs> and he's the dude um i don't know and i've forgotten his name oh boy you're you're, it, you're, you're talking about the writer of, of green lantern back in the in the 90s um the guy who did the the refrigerator, the actual yeah. refrigerator stuff, and dude is super woke now. Yep. Oh no. You know, and, and that's the thing. They kill each other, and they don't have anywhere to go with any of their stories. The story has to be. Um, remember when they start, first started uh, posting? Um, I would be. On, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I haven't been on Twitter in years, but they would they would post a, like a page from the like the female Thor, and it was she she punches. <laughs> Uh, absorbing man or something like that and she's lecturing him and stuff and it's like it's just there's nothing to the story it's not even a story anymore it's, it's a very conflict averse concept because yeah. what they what they assumed was that the hero was fighting somebody who was misunderstood and in truth fantasy and fiction the hero is fighting his own demons or some kind of internalized problem that is externalized for fictional purposes or whatever sure. it might be and that's why yeah. the the best Marvel comic villains are always reflections of the hero. It's a real inner struggle. It's a battle to be better than you are or to overcome your own weakness. But they don't see that. They don't see the allegory and they have no idea what symbolism is. So they can't get past that. It's a huge roadblock. And they don't like conflict because conflict is alien to them, which is why you're describing this problem where you have stories that go nowhere. So what? What? Uh, for first of all, uh, Ron Mars is the author that, that Peter was just talking about. That's the name I was thinking. Yeah. And... Uh, the, something that we talked about on previous Attention Span Labs uh, broadcasts when I was on with, with my wife and with, with Art and on, um, we talked about the, the relationship between um, the, the deconstruction we're talking about, but also the decompression of, of the comics media in that something Peter just mentioned a few minutes ago that, you know, nothing ever happens in, the, in these issues and, and they, they don't fight. And, and there, in fact, there may be there may be three or four issues before they get to a fight. And then the fight is usually over. It's a one shot because like in the, in the, the lady Thor uh, issue you're talking about, Oh, she's just her being able to punch absorbing man out uh, without, without breaking a sweat um, is necessary to their, to their ridiculous political agenda because their, their characters can't have, any challenges whatsoever because they're already perfect as, as we said before um, they don't have anywhere to go. So the, the, the this is also why the, the Mary Sue character who, 
who everybody except SJWs recognizes as a serious problem and, and hates and 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 uh, they don't, they hate they hate those sort of stories. But they, the the um, the Mary Sue character is is the central expression of of their of their anti cultural mindset of their of their yeah. unentertaining stories. Yeah. So for me, I think the the cure and uh, Judd mentioned the hero's journey, and I would have said mythology, but I think Judd's right. I think it is it's it's even more basic than just mythology. Uh, it is the hero's journey. So I'm gonna revise my uh, my previous opinion. Um, that well, uh, it, yeah, and, and mythology, you know, it incorporates the heroes, it. yeah. But but I think you're right. I think it's bigger than even that. Uh, Every time I run across somebody who says, oh, I hate superheroes, I don't really get any kind of superhero comics. I want to read comics about, you know, <laughs> you know, something that's real. Uh, and usually it comes down to they just don't understand mythology. They don't understand what it's for. They don't understand what heroism is. <laughs> that yeah, stuff that's, that's just missing. That's tied into the problem. <laughs> that is absolutely tied into the problem we've had recently with orcs. What are orcs? Are orcs Oh, people? my lord, yes. Or are they something else? No, no, no. They're an archetype of the ravenous horde. There's yeah. no race associated with that. Orcs are just monsters. They're not people. Please figure that shit out. Figure out archetypes. They're important. But, but to make that claim, you are a racist because orcs are obviously black people, say the non-racists. I got yeah. one better for you. Ibram X. Kendi says that everybody is racist. We're just on a spectrum of how racist you are. So whatever. So See, but that's a trick too. When they say that, they go, "But everybody's racist, so it's okay." But then, if but then it turns around if somebody actually does, it's like that guy's <laughs> racist. Then it's like a pylon. It's like you know, watch out, they're coming after you. So, like, that guy's racist, and he's also but, European. Uh, it's yeah. like they'll they'll use the same word, but they'll say, but it, but the meaning of the word seems to shift. Like everybody's a little bit racist, you know? We're we're a uh, systemic racism. That's a, it, that's a trick of postmodernism because postmodernism plays with language. It tries to use language, as, as does the PC problem. It uses language as a tool to define the world in which you discuss any issue. It gives you left and right bounds and then controls how you think and feel about it by saying, no, 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 that's not what that means anymore. We've changed the definition or we didn't say that, but here's the definition and you have to catch up to us. We don't have to explain to you. Well, p part of that, I think, it, it is also just, just the, the stratagem of... of they understand that by and large their enemies whoever their enemies are have values and those those values are more or less immutable um but they themselves don't have they don't have what we call principle right they don't have anything that they'll adhere to so what what they're saying today they will eagerly reject tomorrow if it suits them but they will their strategy has always been to to use uh, other people's uh, other people's morals, other people's uh, political principles ag against them, and uh, and and call them call them uh, hypocrites. It's um, you know call them that say that they're they're not they're not living up to their own um, their own standards. But of course, they have no standards themselves. Well, to use a uh, an oft uh, used quote of late, let's follow the science. I mean the. Goblins, orcs, kobolds, all of those things refer to anything that is underground and is, you know, malignant. Uh, it, uh, most, most, uh, you know, s neurologists and psychologists and stuff are saying that probably these are cultural artifacts of us just knowing that, you know, there are hidden things. There, you know, there are things that are out there and they're spooky and they're scary. And we need, you know, we, we've got wiring in our head to identify those. The, and the dark green, side of fairy tales. Yeah, and they're green and they're putrid because we have a whole system in our head of, of disease avoidance. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so we, we, we layered all these things onto these things. And it's it's key to remember that the term orc was, was first coined by people who had probably never met an African-American or an African or... You know anyone uh, you know of, of, of that heritage so it, it's nonsense and if you want to literally see this in in in, uh, in effect uh, you know sans any any cultural theory look at klingons klingons started off as a veiled reference to the russians and then as they went they sort of morphed into 
whatever we needed them to be at the time. Like Klingons are always some sort of metaphor, but the, what they're a metaphor for changes. And if that's true of orcs, then if you think that orcs are another ethnicity, that says more about you than it says about the orcs, right? I mean, the orcs are kind of a chalkboard that you're writing something on. And yeah, I, I, I can't see how they think that they If you hear to, the dog whistles yeah. all the time, see, this is me coming, me the dog <laughs> yeah. character here. If you keep hearing dog whistles everywhere, you might be a dog just throwing it out there. Yeah. yeah. When they That's cast Michael Dorn as as Worf, the Klingon, it was hailed as a huge a huge move. And then within a decade, it had become, oh, you think Klingons are black people? <laughs> and and uh, it's terrible what the what the way they do these things. It's it's they'll do one thing, and then they'll use the exact same reason and say that uh, the thing that they did for wokeness is now a reason for racism right right when obviously klingons are just baritones because they sound cool i mean it's yeah it's just yeah <laughs> everyone loves klingons right I love klingons. Well, and that's yeah they, they, again they started as this despotic group and then they became oh well, we like despotic stories you know that <laughs> did really good when you know we did i claudius that sold well so let's do that only in space Right. And with a lot of nonsensical bladed weapons. Yeah, the, the Klingons are, are an interesting um, example of this because, you know, as, as you said, it started out, they, they were the Soviets. Uh, and then in the next generation era, I guess, maybe during, you know, the, 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 the lessening of tensions between the West and the Soviet Union, uh, the next generation appeared in 19, uh, 1987. I think um, so. It's the era of like Glasnost and Perestroika, and the solidarity was winning in Poland and stuff like that. So there, there was the idea of this the rapprochement, and then the the Klingons were um, became they originally the Klingons were the completely dishonorable ones, untrustworthy ones. Then the next generation era, they were all about honor, and then now you have the whatever those creatures are that they're calling Klingons in the Star Trek shows that nobody watches on on CBS All Access. I have no and, idea. And there, but, yeah. but, but I, I've succeeded in not watching them. <laughs> I haven't watched right. a single one of them. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. <laughs> haven't haven't even crossed my radar. Uh, oh, me too. I, me too. I I've only, I only know about them secondhand through the like Doomcock and uh, other reviewers and stuff like. That. So I actually, Nerd maybe, yeah, yeah. Maybe 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 yeah. I shouldn't I shouldn't comment on on them too much having not not watched. But they uh, they're they're definitely they're they're the, they're the protein enemy. They're they're whatever you need them to be. At the time, and, and I think that that's that's very much um, the Klingons are essentially the the um, leftist, postmodernist, anti-culturalist. That, that's their 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 values. Their values are, are what their principles are, whatever they need them to be at the time for their own benefit. Um, okay, so we we already uh, touched on several uh, some of the other questions that I had, come, which had brought up were. Which were um, why why is big media so creatively bankrupt? Um, and I, I think some both uh, us and some of our our commenters out there have have really have really hit the nail on the head there, and that um, they're they're limiting them, themselves um, based on fear, and they're being driven by an agenda. So they, they the agenda is foremost instead of the story. Uh, but what what do you guys make of of the the fact that? Um, even people who hate this stuff and let's, let's take, let me call out the comic skate people mm -hmm. like, uh, your boy Zach and, and, uh, uh, yellow flash and all these other guys, they, they go out, they, they hate, they, they openly hate this stuff and they mock it. And yet every month they go out and they buy more books. And I think there there's, there's a, we may have reached the point where the only people that are buying Marvel and DC anymore are the people that hate them. So, <laughs> what, what, um, what do you think the problem is? Is it just, is it just pure? Is it, is it the the, the disease of nostalgia? Is I call it, it, I call it fandom inertia. You know, I, I catch hmm. myself doing this with gaming products. Like, I'll look at new gaming products, and I'm like, oh, that 
looks cool or oh well, there's a spaceship on the cover of that or <laughs> you know and and then now I've, I've filtered more and more so that now i can just look at it and if it says you know xyz is a game about four people going to the funeral i'm like okay we're done like you you, you <laughs> yeah. learn to sift it <laughs> but um but yeah i think i think there's inertia that we want to find sources for adventurous fiction escapism things like that and this, the, the trap now is finding people that do it well or do it in a way that doesn't insult you or doesn't portray you as, as the villain. And, and you know, to circle back, that's what the point of, of this Appendix I is, is to, to share cases where that is true. So and uh, you're, you're too humble to say it, but I would say that um, the Ascension Epic uh, uh, is, is one good example of that and sort of getting into that is what got me more interested in in this pulp revival and and independent comics and things like that and and i think that journey has been beneficial for me i think that the reason that a lot of the uh, you know uh, comic skaters and gamer gators continue to harp on this issue is because it sells i mean people like to hate on this garbage there's a woke movement and then there's an anti-woke movement and i'm probably in the anti-woke movement i'll be honest with you <laughs> I hate this crap. I was going to start, you know, I was about to cuss a whole string of things. Pretty awesome, but the real issue here is that there, there's a there's a movement like like Judd said. There's an inertia, right? There's an inertia, but there's also this this vitriolic hatred of the things that have been created that, that offend our sensibilities. Which is why Jeremy from the Quirting always talks about our mythology, and so does uh, Doomcock. He does it all the time. Our mythology. They're destroying our mythology. Well. People like to hate on the things that are destroying the things they love. So that's part of it, I think. That's a huge part of it. I, yeah, I, it probably makes for an entertaining video, too. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I certainly agree with that perspective. And I, obviously, I watch those videos, too. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm seeking to be outraged by, by the, latest, the latest horrendous illustration of Carol Danvers. You know? And uh, um, yet, I, I think um, that... That's ultimately self-defeating because the that still leaves the enemy, so to speak, in control of the of the culture, um, and uh, so, so the 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 placeholder image for this video is a painting of the siege of Antioch in the First Crusade, um, and this is something I, I brought up on the in the in the, the, the pre live stream chat was that in many respects I, I think it's it's obvious that we have lost the culture war. It's all we, we already lost it. Uh, the the left the anti culture the um, the feminists the SJWs wh whoever you whoever you want to talk about the orcs the orcs are are in complete control over the culture they own the movie studios they own the the, the now four publishing companies they uh, they're in complete control over 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 comics and um, and you know no matter how many times you make a video that Kathleen Kennedy is on the way out. Hey, look! Somehow she managed to survive, and she's still there. There, there's no, um, there's no hope coming from. No matter how much you know, you say, "Oh, I really like the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian is the way forward for Star Wars." They don't care. They're gonna yeah, garbage. They're they're, they're they're going to, um, you know, they're gonna keep putting out what they want to put out, and it's not it's not about money. Um, and and so I think just mocking it. Um, it obviously satisfies a need that we have, but it's not enough. And that that's really what uh, the Appendix I is about, is that we need to create, uh, we need to create our own stuff in, independently. And even if we're referring back to stuff that was, that was published by the big publishers, maybe 30 years ago, 50 years ago, a hundred years ago, that, that stuff, um, that, that stuff uh, needs to be done because we, we are in the position of, of Christendom after in the period right before the Crusades began. You know, we we originally inhabited the Holy Land. Th those were our lands. Those were our people. That's where we lived. Um, we originally inhabited Spain, and then they took that off us. So what we need to do is is in not just mo mocking it from behind our castle walls. We need to go out there and take that back, and we we need to take entertainment back. We need to show yeah. people. That there are uh, there are alternatives, and it's it's okay it's okay to like them, but the the, the question that that you know as a, as frankly an, a not very successful independent author, um, you know I probably sold 
5,000 books of, of all kinds, electronic and, and in, in print. Um, but you know, that, that, that doesn't make a dent. And, and you find like when you go to conventions, people are just really reluctant, um, to go beyond, uh, what they know, um, what and you know what they're really looking for maybe they they seem to say they're even even though they they hate reading current issues of batman they're they're really they, they say they're really just looking for another another issue of batman so how 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 do we do we get beyond that how so do we like, convince people to move beyond that i think yeah, we gotta yeah. we gotta go neo hipster right like we got oh <laughs> yeah i'm really into uh the uh really into the ascension epic uh, you've probably never heard of them and then you know correct your glasses right and then like uh, you know i was into them way before threads was a thing and then you know <laughs> one of the ways i find out about new stuff is there's a couple of channels i follow one of which is cartoonist kayfabe where they'll do a deep dive into a thing and it's often a thing that i don't know too much about and i enjoy go watching them actually go through a book and say what's what's great about the book so that you're we talked about at the beginning of this video um, about lighting a candle, you know, rather than curse the darkness. So maybe, maybe deep dives into some of the, the, the new and the, uh, and the old. There was also a comment that came up from Art Anon Studios that were kind of addicted to nostalgia. Or if it's gen generation Y is very susceptible to nostalgia and, and it being addiction level. And I think, I think that affects, um, I don't know if it affects all of us. It definitely affects me. I, I love nostalgia. I love uh, <laughs> some of the stuff that I grew up with. I think it's great. I like to revisit it from time to time. But, um, you know, when you are when you start looking at, um, let's say, Jack Vance novels or mythology, that's not nostalgia. That's We're, we're talking about great literature. You know, we're talking yeah. about some of the, the great works of mankind. Uh, I just, I recently did a... Um, a story you can see my avatar is Frankenstein there. I'm trying to do like a, a Frankenstein comic book, and um, I'm I'm not doing a, a Universal Studios type of Frankenstein. I'm using the Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's novel because he talks and he's very erudite. He's the most erudite character in the book. Um, so uh, I think there has to be a point where we do deep dives. Another channel that I really like for this, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, Fizzfop, the guy who does uh, Forgotten Heroes of the Golden Age, and he explains them. He uh, recently put one, I guess it might've been a couple of months ago, called uh, The Green Turtle, and I, I was avoiding this video because it sounds silly, but it turns out to be one of these really interesting Golden Age comic book heroes that was uh, designed by a guy who came over from China and... Um, he wasn't allowed to make an Asian hero, so he made it so that even the reader didn't understand who the character's secret identity was. And he has this really interesting spirit animal thing that you never see in the Golden Age. It's it's like the most unique comic I think I've ever seen. Y'all, I might um, get booted real quick, so stand by for that. I got some power issues in my house. Sorry, keep going. Uh, let's go, go right ahead. All right, uh, so anyways, uh, there has to be a way to, to, to bring a light to the things that are cool, that are interesting. And you said, go Neo Hipster. Well, maybe we should not do that, but... Uh, yeah actually focus in and get people to you know you got you got to get a lot of people on board to understand and develop a fandom around a thing and it's got to it's got to come from within um yeah. so maybe uh, an ascension epoch um uh deep dive or um you know you got to build those communities otherwise we're all really 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 splintered of course they um we, we were told that the internet was sort of for everybody and there is no high ground it's run by corporations so anything that we do we got to we got to do it on our own we got to get organized and uh, we got to build stuff on our own i know a lot about this cuz i've been doing it with the uh, the comic collaboration i tried to get a lot of people that were just completely uh, atomized uh, comic creators who would do one or two pages or they were you know doing mini comics and things like that and we managed to get everybody um, in involved in an anthology and people really jumped on it you know it's it, it's really impressive um, well, I've, so, yeah i've got uh, the first two and and uh, i guess the hollow holiday one's making its way to me but yeah that's yeah, I, I mean that's amazing stuff and and i wouldn't have heard about it except that yeah that people you know that i've gotten to know fairly recently uh you know hit me to it so yeah. I, I guess we just need to be signal repeaters for each other we and, definitely you know, do yeah, as we do stuff, 
say, hey, this is something cool. It's really neat. You know, it's probably pretty exclusive. You may, you may not be cool enough for it. You know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, that, that sell, it's a, it's a crappy sales technique, but word of mouth is not. Like, I mm. like this, and I think you would like it too. And then all that has to happen is for them to, to like that thing. And then they know you can be trusted. Like, oh, this guy knows his stuff or, you know, and like when it comes to independent comics, you know, or what, what have you, and just build our cachet, you know, because once that snowball gets a certain size, there's no stopping it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we just, I, I, I think we just need to repeat signal for each other. And, it, it started and, out as the internet was all about message boards and then it became <laughs> blogs and then it became social media and social media is run by corporations and they, right. they run it they to all lean promote themselves. And uh, we got to take it back. <laughs> I, I, I've said several times that I think the internet would be much better if it went back to how the internet was in say 1999 or 2000 when you know <laughs> everybody had had you you were on IRC or you were on a, a, bullet, a, a bulletin board system. Uh, everybody had their own uh, GeoCities website, and and it was all you. Yeah, it was there was a, a higher bar for entry. But what it actually was is it allowed you to do what you wanted rather than um, you, you didn't take this prepackaged stuff that um, where your user experience was totally defined by this corporation. What you saw was completely defined by the corporation that, you know, you didn't have fact checkers uh, saying, well, actually, you know, for everything you post, um, whereas now it, it – um, Several people in the comments have, have said how how atomized people are, um, and and I, I think I think it, it's it's really true that there that social media has contributed to that and makes everybody uh, there. We don't we don't what should have been this this great opening of connections and communications with with between people all over the world has really turned into a choke point. It's the exact um, opposite of what it said it would do. It, exactly. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a big group, and you can't negotiate a big group without, you know, finding like like-minded people, right? So you you put your feelers out, and then you find your click, and then you click, and then as soon as that happens, you're you're going to find the edges of your group pretty quickly, and everyone else is those people, right? So so yeah, it it's made it easier for for you know people to find like-minded people and it's made it very easy for you to just turn off the the people that you don't want to hear you know um so yeah, yeah there's a mental discipline there that that i don't think a lot of people practice and and the more that happens the more you know the more extreme and the more divisive things are going to be but but i i gotta think that the stuff we're talking about is pretty resonant, and I, I can't imagine you'd have to be pretty far gone on on either side not to see, you know, that 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 that, that, that stripe of what we're talking about is is what makes us us, you know, and it's it's what's best in people, uh, not just you know our culture, but it's it's our culture's take on what is best in people and how to be a good person and how to be someone your neighbors trust and. Yeah, I, I I think yeah, social media finds a way to to divide us up that way, and ironically, by letting us contact anyone in the world, you know, who is also part of this big experiment, and it's a strange irony. But well, they get herded into groups, and then they cancel the group, or they hide the group, or they shadow ban people. They there's all so many different ways, so many games they're running on people. Yeah. Or they get you all on Google Plus and then get rid of it. Right? Yeah, then they dump. Remember that? <laughs> I wonder if that's going to happen to Parlor too. Well, be a contraction, I, I think. But but hopefully, as things contract, they'll they you know. And I think we've gotten to a point of contraction where there's only a few games in town, and you know they do something dumb. Not that that would ever happen, but if they did do something really dumb, then people would be like, "Oh, I need an alternative to this." And then they would go find it. So I, I think there's going to be a compression and a retraction every so often of of this sort of thing, and hopefully that leads to some sort of good middle ground. Uh, I think your compression is going to be a whole lot of people losing a lot of money. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, so, and, and I'm which is going on, they, which is happening. They don't right. care about Thank goodness. People, you know, like there are people greenlighting $350 million projects that they know is only going to appeal to, a, you know, just a small segment. I, I don't think they don't care now, Judd, but they're going to care when it destroys their voice, when their voice gets cut off because they have no funding. It'll be after the damage is done, but it's going to cause that happen. You know, that'll be that'll be done for them. There's got to be some kind of collapse coming, and it, that Chinese money ain't going to last forever. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I wonder how how much of of the open destruction of popular properties of media of 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 squandering money is not an intentional thing, and and I don't know whether it's intentional because the kind of people that are in charge of it just simply don't understand like the economics and they're and they're unmoored from it because you know they're they're, um, you know, not, not not to pick on such people, but they're the liberal arts majors. They're, they're they're avowed socialists. So, like, who cares? It's just money. It's 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 rich white people's money. Who cares, right? But um, or or whether it's it's actually um, it's it's a psychosis caused by the e easy money of credit expansion, of the uh, and we're I'm probably I'm, I'm getting probably far out of field here, but you know we 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 have. Um, in many respects, our, our economy is built on debt. Uh, it's built on f uh, fiat money. Um, and they just keep, and it's like, hey, we, we can we can lock down the country and we'll just print more money and it'll all be okay. And uh, I, that that's sort of the, the ultimate example of that that we've seen this last year. But um, for, for a long time, there, uh, people just had completely unrealistic um, uh ideas about what they could do with money and, and with their weird accounting procedures, the way a movie studio will, will actually make like close, you know, they'll may, maybe they make half a billion dollars in profit, but they rig it so that they actually make zero profit because they, Oh, that we, we'll, we have this sub studio who is technically a separate entity and we contracted it out to that. And, and, and then they, they think uh, maybe, maybe over, over, over years go by, They've actually lost track of what these things are actually costing them until they, you know, uh, uh, obviously the party has to end some at some point. Um, and but they maybe have lost sight of how close they are to the cliff and the, what's happening with uh, Walt Disney Company now where they laid off like 30,000 people. The parks are closed or nobody's coming. The theaters are closed. They, there's no they invest all this money in cruise lines and stuff anymore. They you know, I. I have a concern. I have a concern about all that. Obviously, I have a concern about all that. The way that I see it is that the people that are pushing for all of this, uh, this, this, this craziness, let's just say, you know, they, everyone that's pushing for the destruction of IP, they don't have an end game in mind. But that doesn't mean that no one has an end game in mind. Once it's all been crushed, I guess uh, Jonathan Pajot talks about this a lot. He says that once you've destroyed all your walls, all your barriers, all of the definitions you have for society, I'm paraphrasing here, it makes it very easy for somebody with a strong identity to come through and crush everything. Right. And to just burn off all the chaff and make a totalitarian sort of regime. And it looks like that preparation work is underway. I don't know. I that's, agree that's completely. Gonna, yeah. Yeah. Like so there's the, go ahead. I have Amazon Prime, and we watch shows and stuff like that. Anytime there's a channel, they have different channels that they advise. And they're like, oh, uh, movies we think you'll like, uh, uh, adventure movies. Anytime they do a thing that says movies about social justice or movies featuring <laughs> right. this this racial voice or this you know uh, racial uh, character, I always block all of those content. I, I, always, I, I don't want to watch any of that. And it might be Amen, something brother. I might even like. I, you know, it might even be something I would like, but I think, I feel like this, it's manipulative and there's, so, there's something ugly behind For it. Sure. You know, there's something very sinister um, when they push that. Yeah. Amen, brother. You're right on that. The way that I see it, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of subversion that's happening, you know, in, in streaming media and in all kinds of major outlets. Amazon Prime is a good one. YouTube does it all the time, of course. And then Netflix is the worst with like cuties and all that garbage. Yeah. The, it's very hard to find something that doesn't oh, have. I dumped cuties entire. I mean, I'm not cuties. I dumped Netflix entirely. So I'm about I, to do it. Yeah. So did I. My kids are my kids are going to cry out in agony, but it's going to happen. It's going. 
but the 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 problem here is that we we haven't until recently identified all of this this subversion that happens and even our old cinema and our old art our old books it was in there too we didn't see it now neil gaiman is an example that i use a lot uh, i tried to read the book um so i read the book uh, good omens loved it thought it was hilarious then i watched the show and the show is riddled with social justice cues throughout the whole mm -hmm. thing. But when I watched it again, I realized that the entire foundation of the story is subversive to Western civilization. It's in a lot of our literature. They they actively tried to destroy the foundations. Christianity is a good example of that. You know, the natural law theory is an example. The idea of heroism and the different elements that make up the cardinal virtues. They've subverted these for decades. And it, you know what? One of the good things about all this is that it's becoming very clear, at least to me, and I think to a lot of people now, oh, yeah, that trick, they were pulling that trick for a long time. And we can see it. When those old movies pop up in your queues on Amazon Prime, Netflix, and YouTube, you can see it and say, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's what they were trying to sell me back then. And now I know when I talk to my kids, when I read stories to my kids, I can say, ah, see, when Neil Gaiman is talking in the Graveyard book, for instance, about how Christians are judgmental and closed-minded, that wasn't accurate to the time. And I think that's just really him throwing little arrows at Christianity, which he has personal beef with. That's yeah. the problem. So, so why do artists hate civilization? Uh, let me just put, put it bluntly out there. Obviously there are exceptions to that. And obviously some of the, 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 the greatest accomplishments of civilization are in the arts. Obviously we are talking about the, the great painters and sculptors and the, the composers and so forth. But yeah. what there, there is, is, seems to me uh obvious hostility and it's not purely in the in the you know early 2000s it it goes back you you can see there um if you go back even hundreds of years you'll see um artists who are um they're they're they are subversive and they're they're seeking to uh to overturn what whatever you got you know it's it's like it's the, the you know, what are you rebelling against what you got and and so you have you know the the oscar wilde types or um the the marquis de sods um what 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 do you guys th think it is uh, about about that, creativity that that appeals that that kind of I, stuff appeals i to? think it's neurological i think you know the society needs two kinds of people we need you know we need rule uh rule not obeyers I, I think everyone should be a rule obeyer but we, we need people that that hold the line and people that test the limits and creatives are, are typically the people that test the limits you know and they're and they're about the big ideas and you know they're they're extroverts typically you know they they like um they like the chaos of being outside the map right and so they it's supposed to work, I believe, in the in the grand scheme of things, that they go out and they find new ideas and they toy with those new ideas, and then they bring them back and we say, oh, we like this, we don't like that, no, oh, you made a good point here. You know, it it used to be where there was a dialectic in there, you know, mm -hmm. a discussion, yeah. and and both sides got to say, like, you know, the 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 right right brained people would be like oh i don't know where you came up with that for but we can slot it in here and and then they would go out and do something weird and come back and we'd say oh okay we can we we got no use for that you know and then so they're 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 supposed to be that kind of uh interplay that slowly pulls you to a you know a, an order that is more acclimatized to the current situation and i think somewhere in that there was this idea of anointing the the you know the, the left-brained uh, creative types and and I, I think the Renaissance uh, and and you know and now the dot-com boom and thing you know we've seen these highly inventive people who are not practical people but they're inventive people and and they've had massive success in, in a lot of key ways because they've invented these life-changing technologies or ideas or, or artistic movements. And, and, and so Jed, they, they gathered a celebrity around them. Judd, I think that there's a, there's an issue here. I mentioned before we, before the stream started that some of these artistic types, they just, they go way out and what they really want is acceptance. They want accolade. 
you know, they're, they're kind of shallow in a lot of ways. They, they are it's creative. So they're, yeah, they're creative. But the, the issue here is that they want to fit into the culture in which they find themselves. Yeah. Right? It, a a long time culture, ago, Christianity was the establishment. It's right, no longer the establishment. Now they are seeking approval That's by right. knocking it. And now the most creative thing, the most rebellious thing, the most uh, outsider thing that you can do is like the ending of uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas where they – where they read that verse out of the Bible. That, <laughs> right. yes. that That is a showstopper. If you showed that now, I don't think you could show that on television right now where they, at the very end, where Linus right. pulls out the Bible and reads do, that verse. Do they? I, yes. I can't, I can't yeah. recall not, if I've seen them play it. Yeah, this, this, this year is the first year in like 50 some years that, that they haven't showed it on network TV. Uh -huh. so, I heard there was an outcry and they decided that they would show the Christmas special and the, and the Thanksgiving special. Maybe. We'll see. I don't know. I still I bet, they cut it. I bet they censor it. And, and, on the 23rd. But with every, but with every, you know, situation like this, this is our opportunity. This is the opportunity for any creator who wants to actually say there's, there is nothing bigger of an idea. There is nothing uh, more deeper of a philosophy, and now that belongs to the realm of the anti-establishment. Now we can say those things as artists, right? And, um, you know, I thought I was being kind of daring in the holiday special of the, my last panel. Um, I put a – there's a there's a, a scene where um, there's a cross in there, and I thought, this is really daring of me. I don't know if I could even do this. You know? <laughs> but I put it in there. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of it. I think I want to go further with, you know, with other stuff. Um, but that to me is, is the fact that we can be a little bit more, we, we can be the rebels now. We can be the, uh, we're, we're the anti-establishment. Yeah. Well, I, we've got to get over. I think, I think we've had, uh, I hate to say this, sort of the polite society kind of thing of like, well, we have our beliefs, but we don't want to force them on anyone. And then they are like, well, we have counter beliefs and we're going to force them on as many people yeah. as we can find. They're absolutely going to force them. Yes, you're totally right. And, so, and, and not to put too fine a point on this, but they're winning. And and that that has to be why. And, and we, we've we avoided confrontations for too long. And we, we basically uh, uh, ceded the ground to them over the last, I would say, at least two generations. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, it, it needs to be taken back. It says a lot for their ground game that Peace. they have been successful in marketing a depressing, dehumanizing, and divisive message as well as they have. I mean, they've got no product and they've sold it well. So we have. Uh, Wackbecker said something pretty funny. He said, hey, at, at uh, Imperian Vol, that was almost a conservatism is punk line there. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing as you guys were talking. We're the new punk now. That's how it goes. Stinch We're going to put also, the safety in safety pans. Stinch the punk rock added. thing to do now is to have a family and to pay your taxes and, and kind of do that. I yes. Guess. Yeah. So, so Stinch also has a question for you, Joe. Aren't validation and acceptance universals? Um, yeah, I specifically didn't answer that question or bring it up because I wasn't 100% sure what he's talking about. But uh, the way that I see acceptance and validation, yes, they are universal needs to the human psyche. But what I was referring to was kind of a moral scheme in which to work and find those things. So the scheme here has to be one which is based off of objective truths. And that's why Christianity is an easy go-to for us in the West. When you live in a world where God is centered, it's if you want acceptance and validation, it comes from God. It comes from the community in which God is, is, is the most important thing. Now, you don't have to be Christian. Obviously, there are other cultures that have this value. I personally believe that Christian values are the ones to go by. I think they're the best. But I'm, I'm a little biased in that. Would, that's kind of you, how I see that answer. Would you accept maybe the word prominence? You think that that's, I mean, you, I was talking about that dichotomy. Do you think that they're, uh, they think, oh, we're the idea guys and, you know, all the, all the schmoes are just supposed to, uh, no offense, <laughs> to, <laughs> hey, to your clan of schmoes. I love offense. Go for it. All right. Right but, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, the schmoes are just supposed to, you know, implement. Like, we we're going to think, you know. think of stuff and then, they're going to take care of the implementation and we're going to go right. find the next thing to be angry about. So as somebody who is also an idea man, as well as a schmo, I totally understand what you're saying there. Uh, I think anybody who's creative, you know, like, like Mike, for instance, anyone that's creative is going to, they're going to seek to spread their, uh, not poison. I mean, that's not the word I'm going with their, their art, their ideas, 
because they want to see that validation come back and they want to see, you know, what they do in the world kind of have an impact or have an effect. It's, it's part of their drive, you know, but yeah. I don't think, I don't think it has to be, it doesn't have to be me centered. It can also be society centered, God centered or whatever it might be. You know, it can, it can be, it can be, it can be fed by higher motivations and higher needs. And I think that's true across all cultures. Yeah. We've lost yeah. a lot of that. Well, and, and I think the difference is, is that when you, when you read their stuff, you, you're getting the ideal, you're getting the, the story, you're getting the, the reaffirmment that, you know, the good guys always win, even in the 80s, you know, sort of feel, to quote the great, um, uh, the great movie, um, uh, Megaforce, but you, you get, you get an ideal, and I think, I think sometimes their creations are about them, you know, like, and you can tell because they want to be big on the poster, you know, or what, what have you, you know, like you can tell when, when it's an ego thing and not a entertainment thing. And, and I don't think, I think, you know, a good creator when they're more worried about the impact of what they've done than whether you remember their byline or, you know, but, so yeah, it's, it's sort of a difference in focus and, and it's pretty apparent when you see it done right. So you know what I was thinking about, actually? I was thinking, sorry, sorry to interrupt one more time. But I was thinking about, a, um, I was thinking about classical music, and I was really impressed with something, a song called uh, Claire de Lune. Mm -hmm. Claire de Lune was Debussy. And I, I thought, this is an amazing piece of art. This is moving in ways I can't explain. You know, this is a, fantastic <laughs> classical music. And I said, I need to read about this guy because I know he's a, can I, can I cuss again? Can I cuss again? Yeah, sure, sure. I know this guy's a fucking asshole. I know it. <laughs> so I read about Debussy and sure enough, total asshole. Now, the thing is, his skill was important and it served a society where those values were still important. The values that, that we still believe are important. But he was a horrible I, person. I but maintain the society that he changed got, his creative. Good. I maintain that, that he got paid by the quarter note. It's the only way to explain his work. <laughs> <laughs> but he so that's he somebody who plays amazing. piano right there judd you're a piano player <laughs> i'm not but i have seen sheet music of debussy and i'm like oh my goodness like, yeah. you're gonna run out, of, gonna run very, out very flowery or was in the 1700s yeah. <laughs> but see his creative output was it, was it was caged by the society in which he developed it and that's going to have a huge impact on the artists in the future they're very susceptible to influence we know this now this is a fact yeah. these guys are the guys that will stab us in the back we have to create a society where their impulses are caged in some regard. And that just means we have to be good people and set good examples. That's it. That's It's about yeah. leadership. I believe this. We, this was brought before. How do you fix this problem? You be a leader. You yeah. show people what is goodness. It's like in my favorite movie, you know, Judd brought up his, his before, I'll bring up mine, Con Air, right? I'm going to show you God exists, right? <laughs> Nicholas Cage, run into the... My favorite movie is uh, Seven Faces of Dr. Lau. Yeah, don't misunderstand yeah, that Megaforce is my favorite movie. It's just a <laughs> great movie. <laughs> you know, uh, Joe, you, you bring up an interesting point that I, I think is worth talking about more is uh, when you said that um, if you have skill, if, if you have something important to offer, even, even, a, even a very... Um, uh, well, conservative or, or or traditionally restrictive society will tolerate you more i think in, in in general i think that of all human cultures you know you have the um whether we're talking on a, on a on an empire nation state level down to you know your workplace the guys who uh a guy can be an asshole a guy can be abrasive a, a guy can be a pervert or, or or um you know whatever but if they if they're really smart if they if they're really good at getting the job done you can you you can talk you can give them a lot more leeway than you, you can otherwise um so i think it's quite remarkable today that we're so far gone that the most degenerate artists that we have the the are are completely without talent um, and you see like the, these, these comic books being put out and they're all, all the, the progressive mania and SJWism and all this crap. And it's, uh, their work sucks. There's no yep. redeeming value to it at all. Um, so I, I, I see a note of hope in that, that we, we may actually be at, at the, 
end stage of, of 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 the woke empire like they they, they can't go anymore because they're they're already they're, they're they've dredged the bottom of the barrel and maybe we have we have a we have a counterpoint that we, we can have a resurgence and strike them down. we can already compete with them on writing if we can compete with them on art we'd kill them yeah. oh. I, I think I think any uh, you know P Peter will we'll talk about the the the, the triple A group. I th I think that um, l looking at the the art that was in that most recent Captain Marvel book. Um, oh see, man, that was horrible. Thought, like any, any any given person there, no matter how how amateur, and there is a lot of very good, very talented artists on there. Um, but but even like you know the the most amateurish people that you'd find, you pr you probably find like a, a seventh grader. That could put out better art than that, and and here here these are people in, um, you know, getting paid by the the comic book company to, yep. to do art, and it's, yeah. it's awful. The salaries are shrinking. Yeah, I was gonna say that my art would get booted <laughs> off the refrigerator from you know Annika Age Four, <laughs> but I feel like I could draw better than some of the alternate covers I've seen. <laughs> well. I, the, I, one of those uh, we mentioned your boy Zach and, and how he does some of these kind of hit videos where he's where he criticizes stuff, but he was pointing his stuff out like missing shadows underneath cars and um, yeah. you know unfinished unfinished lines like they just didn't even bother to finish the line on a outline of a character. It was the the salaries have shrunk to the point where they're they are on uh, some very amateur talent that they're. I don't know if they're recruiting them right out of out of schools or if they're just getting. I, hey, I know a guy, and he happens to live in New York, and he's he's submitted some stuff. Or if it's just tryout art, like they used to do in the '80s. There's a couple of books where you would see why does this book have 12 artists, you know, and you would find out. Oh, that's where they tried everybody out. So, um, but I think they're doing that a lot. So, is he, are you putting forth the idea that that they may have a whole bullpen of people working for exposure? <laughs> uh, not exactly. They're not. Nobody's. Nobody works for them. They're all contractors, and some of them may be freebies that they've got going on. Yeah, we're talking about artists that that pen and draw different kinds of comic books. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that it, the problem is that the editors don't want to tell them they they suck. Basically, they don't want to challenge them because they they're afraid. Yeah. I, I I don't know it so much as that. I, I think part of it really is the sl the slave labor mentality. Like they, <laughs> they they don't have a budget. They and they want to find people who will work for um, what your boy Zach calls cat food wages. Well, uh, Ethan Van Skyver talks about how the the uh, the problem in a lot of those is that they don't they don't edit their drawings. Like the missing shadows. That's an right. editing problem. You fix that, but you have to tell somebody, hey, you suck, or you're well, if I can cuss again, your shit's all fucked up, right? The the, the back and let make them fix it. The editors and and this this is why I, I say like that that the subversion the really bad subversion goes way way back more than most of the current commentators realize. I think um, yeah. like if, if you if you ask Art Anon, he says Marvel went bad in 1968. Uh, so I I don't quite go go that far, but I remember having an argument with Tom Brevoort uh, circa 2004 <laughs> 2005 on but back when Mar when Marvel had had um forums on their website and and he he was the editor who for a long time did all the continuity stuff and he there he was he was arguing with me that continuity doesn't matter you know so when you you don't care about story continuity you don't care about character consistency but well, I, I mean something like noticing a shadow in our cars is missing that doesn't matter at all yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true as a moon knight fan i second that but I, and I'm no comic expert, but I think the Marvel comics, or well, I'm not sure if this was Marvel, but comics in general uh, had two moments where they dropped the ball. And that's when they created Dial H for Hero, and also when they got rid of Dial H for Hero. I love Dial H for Hero. <laughs> <laughs> love that comic. They were, they were just, they were like, oh, we've run out of ideas. Can you guys just send us superheroes? <laughs> Oh, but I never missed an issue with that. But, if but I it could. was, but it was a really good comic. <laughs> I gotta check this out. I haven't even seen this. Dial H for Hero was a DC comic. Uh, I, I yeah, suspected yeah. it might have been as soon as I said Marvel. I knew I it would was be wrong. It was based on submissions from fans. 
So kids would write in with their stupid ideas for superheroes, and they would take them and make comics out of them, and they were hilarious. They were so funny. Well, let's talk about a kid named Jim Shooter, who in the the early oh, yeah? se- early seventies wrote in and created the the Karate Kid character for 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 Legion of Superheroes. Yeah, and and then he was you know, he, I don't know how old he was at the time thirteen or something like that. Thirteen or fourteen? Yeah, they actually had to call his mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they're like, "Hey, man, you're good. We want you to write stories." And and so I I, I think like then and and now, um, most of the best creative stuff is coming from from outside, um, but. But the difference is back then they recognized a real talent. And of course, then Jim Shooter became the the man who put Marvel back on track when Marvel, uh, a lot of people don't realize how bad, uh, what bad financial shape Marvel was in in the 70s. One um, of the great saints of Marvel. Yeah, Jim Shooter. Absolutely. And 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 what is the interesting point about, about Jim Shooter when you talk to the people that work there? They all hated him. Uh, and, and they, you know... Uh, John Byrne and and uh, Chris Claremont and all these people and and they'll 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 badmouth him all the time because he actually made them do their job. Yeah, they burned and, him in effigy. They had a barbecue uh, where they burned him in effigy or something like that. And and then uh, John Byrne made sure to destroy his hometown in one comic after they <laughs> yep. after Jim Shooter finally quit. <laughs> but he was the guy who kept everything on track. He kept it all running. Everything you love about Marvel in the throughout the seventies and eighties is probably Jim Shooter behind it. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, so we're we're coming up on an hour and a half here, and uh, I think we going we, strong. We we may be hit, hitting the uh, the the attention span limit here, but the, uh, so I, <laughs> I want I want to ask uh, devote the rest of this this uh, live stream to asking you guys to talk about um, some of the independent or um, some of the if if they're not independent, like some of the old stuff that that uh, represents the values of the appendix I of defending civilization, just, just generally entertaining media. It can be movies. It can be books. It can be comics. It can be music, whatever you like. So uh, Judd, why don't you start? Well, I, I most heartily recommend um, things that are in the public domain, uh, pulp, pulp things, especially um, project Gutenberg is a great source for, a lot of uh, classic literature and uh, a lot of adventure fiction that's uh, Planet Magazine, for example, is being uh, uh, picked up by them and, and uh, they add a number of uh, stories from those uh, uh, and Galaxy as well uh, periodically. So um, uh, LibriVox uh, is the audiobook equivalent uh, and, you know, they, they are a volunteer shop. Um, I would recommend anything by um, uh, uh, anything by Lester Dent under his numerous pen names. Uh, he chiefly Doc Savage. Um, Doc Savage unfortunately is not in the public domain. Uh, he uh, is is owned by Condé Nast, I think, magazine still for some yeah. reason. Um, but they uh, they were willing to work something out with Black Mask at one point, but uh, I think they, they're ceasing to just sort of scared the owner of that side enough that that they folded up, um, unfortunately, uh, because they were a very good aggregator of pulp. Um, I would say for people that are doing it currently, uh, I would uh, I'm going to plug two of you guys. Uh, the Ascension Epic books are, are excellent, um, and the AAA comic creators uh, uh, and and the constituent people that work on that uh, all do excellent work. Um, I've gotten into Brian Nehemiah lately. He writes uh, uh, science fiction, uh, a lot of uh, sort of mil, uh, military science fiction. Um, and he has a nonfiction book called Don't Give Money to People That Hate You, which is almost, yeah, is almost a, a uh, you know, a position statement uh, for kind of the Appendix I idea. Um, nice. And I'm sure I am forgetting sources, but that is the whole purpose of our, uh, our MeWe group is to aggregate that stuff. So my faulty memory is is not the only source. Okay, Joe Schmo, what about you? Awesome. I think I'll start off with mentioning a couple of foundational things for me. Some things that help me bridge the gap between what is important and what is woke and garbage. So James Lindsay and New Discourses, fantastic source. 
he goes through and destroys deconstructionism and also all of the critical race theory, gender studies, et cetera, all the stuff that's really it's destroying the foundation of Western civilization and liberalism. And he maps it out really well. You got to check it out. James Lindsay, New Discourses, he's on, he's on YouTube. He's got his own website. Jonathan Pajot, The Symbolic World, helped me understand how symbolism really drives the way that we understand everything. And it's unavoidable because, as he says, symbolism happens. And uh, building on that, I would talk about Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And also, if you like to watch shows, Hero's Journey is a documentary. You can find that series on Amazon Prime, so that's good to check out. And then, of course, after that, you got to watch Star Wars. you got to watch 13th Warrior, Dragon Slayer, which is a fantastic movie that no one ever pays attention to. Uh, as you see the dog here, check out The Storyteller. That's really good stuff. That's old-fashioned folk stories with, uh, you know, puppetry, which is really great stuff. And, and that's just elemental. Um, I'd also mention RJ over at The Fourth Age on YouTube. I think that some of you guys might like him. RJ is a true classical conservative, and he goes through Aristotelian values and virtues and, and it examines how, especially in the comic book world, but also across pop culture, the concept of heroism is under direct assault. RJ, The Fourth Age, fantastic. He destroys postmodernism in the course of his series. you got to check him out. He's awesome. And that's how you can understand how heroism truly is founded in our in our culture and our traditions. Um, I got a bunch of other names, you know. I, I would mention Indiana Jones, of course. That's just elemental. Conan the Barbarian, John Milius, David Gamal, and uh, of course, I think that um, Mike, you mentioned David Stewart. He's awesome. I love David Stewart. He's he's great. He really tackles this stuff really well, and has a good perspective. So it's worth checking out. Okay, Peter. Uh, well, first of all, I want to mention that everything that you get from Lulu is right now thirty percent off. That's a big deal. So. Um, if you haven't picked up any of the nine volt uh, anthologies, now is a great time to do it. Um, I also I just put out, in fact, I just actually sent out the print order on Thanksgiving morning my Frankenstein comic, which is going to be free. It is a um, it's a floppy traditional comic printed on newsprint. Um, post I'll post to the uh, MeWe group uh, some way that you can get it. I've got a mailing list over on the Discord, so I'm sending them out to anybody who wants one on the on the Discord. But if you aren't on the Discord, I'll post the same thing out on MeWe somehow, figure out how we can do some kind of mailing list that way. Um, the thing that I really want to promote is Tezuka Osamu's The Phoenix, uh, which is a 12-volume, and and in manga volume, could be hundreds of pages, um, uh, generational se series. I don't know if you ever saw Cloud Atlas, that movie they came out with a, a while back. It's generational. You, they keep, kept seeing the... The stories of the same actors over and over again. Yeah. The Phoenix is a little bit like that. It touches on um, a number of different things, but it also touches on Christianity. By the time they get to, um, I think it's volume eight, it starts out in prehistoric times. It goes all the way to the far future. And then it jumps back to, to like ancient Japan. Uh, in volume eight, they land on a planet that they name heaven. It's just a man and a woman. And uh, they create a paradise. And there are generations of Children, uh, the first child is named Cain. Uh, Lot is one of the uh, uh, descendants of this group. You really have to read this uh, this series. It's really, really cool. Um, and it has a lot of stuff about robots and consciousness and, and all kinds of things. It's a very deep series. Um, and, yeah, I guess that that's all I can talk about. Oh, yeah, Dial H for Hero. Dial H for Hero, I think... Um, Ardenon has already mentioned that it's uh, is it action comics or adventure comics. Um, he's got the list that are, yeah, 340 to 380 <laughs> adventure comics. This was actually a great series if you could run across it uh, somewhere. Uh, it is super funny. There is a Dial B for blog blog that goes over the stuff in Dial H for Hero, and it's very, very cool. So you can see all that stuff. Um, and that's all I have. I am now looking forward to the idea of Tubal Cain making Mecca because it just makes sense, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I want to first, um, with, without duplicating many of the excellent suggestions that, that people have, have already, the panelists have already made, I want to call out some of the creatives that are, are in our group. Um, Carlos Carrasco, um, Brad Walker, um, maybe to, uh, Let's see who else is uh, who else is in this group. Uh, the the comics produced by the uh, the the nine volt everybody who's contributes to nine volt studios, uh, 
the their the nine volt anthology. Um, so you have uh, Ardenon's work uh, is excellent. So we're we're gonna we're gonna put out links to a lot of these things where you can buy them on Amazon, on Lulu, and and elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> I want to call out two of uh, my friends, Richard Rowland and Ben Fian, who I also put links to, to their work that's uh, available uh, in PDF and print on on Amazon. Uh, I was hoping to get them to join tonight, but they were having a, an extended Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, they couldn't join us, but they write uh, excellent. Um, uh, superhero and adventure stories that are, are grounded in a in a, a, a Christian traditional um, uh, uh, th that kind of mindset and with a with a love for the the old style of comics, but also made it with like high literature and it's it's uh, very good. It's something that you don't see uh, very often in the wild here. Um, and uh, I also want want to. Um, draw i want to encourage everybody to do two things one read books from the public domain from project gutenberg if you have a kindle you can these are the books that you can download for free uh read books by the greats if you like horror i want you to read books by arthur mackin and algernon blackwood and robert w chambers if if you if you like um uh science fiction i want you to read uh jules verne and um Maybe you can read the um, the 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 proto pulps like um, Tom Swift and Frank Reed and stuff like this. They, they they're these are not all high literature by any means, right? Some of some of them are. Some of the names I'm going to mention are, are high literature, and some are 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 pulps, right? But um, it's it's great to get us a, a sense of of the. So most people today simply are unaware of these things. They're unaware of this enormous deposit of cultural heritage that uh you know certainly it is i think it's probably most accessible in the early 20th century we're talking about people like edgar rice burroughs arthur conan doyle really really tremendous um uh story crafters um but then you you go back into to the 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 somewhat maybe nowadays Somewhat more high flute and less accessible. You know, the, the Mary Shelley types, um, you know, um, stuff like like stuff like Frankenstein, um, which which some people can find a difficult read today. But um, but the books, particularly from the early period of the 20th century, and maybe from like 1850 on, there's such a, a tremendous. You know, there's the Sherlock Holmes books. There's a Professor Challenger. There's there's, there's Dracula. There's things that that a lot of people know. In that, in that they they've heard of them, right? But they're not familiar with them. So go go back and really make yourself familiar with these things, and um, that that obviously informs a lot of our Ascension Epoch stuff, um, and where we we integrate those into our background. Um, and but it just in general, there, there's an enormous amount of, of cultural enrichment there. You, you get really highly entertaining stories that. Um, you know, there's a reason that you're familiar with them today without without uh, really m most people have never have never read Dracula right but they they think they, they think they know him right there's a reason that they became um, such such important cultural touchstones so read the originals and they're free um, and you could you can download them from project Gutenberg you can download them on the Kindle you can go to uh, um, what's the the audiobook site? Uh, LibriVox. LibriVox, right? Yeah. So you can, if you drive to work, you can download them, put them on, on a on a CD, and, li and listen to them on your commute or, or whatever. Um, you know, stream them on. There's a lot of uh, public domain audiobooks on on YouTube. Um, read those. Read the pulps if you can. If you can find them, the old, the old, um, you know, Doc Savage, The Shadow, stuff like that. Um, read stories that when you understand that that obviously they're there is a continuum uh, of artistic grandeur in them, uh, but but there these are highly entertaining stories, and we realize that that um, they all value heroism, right? And they and there's they're they're rooted in something, um, and they're they're not they're not to if they're tearing anything down, it's uh, selfishness and villainy, you know. So uh, definitely go outside, uh, um, you know don't just watch the movie based on this stuff like don't go out and just just watch hey you know um the last tarzan actually I, although the last tarzan movie it was reasonably good 
um you know don't just go out and do it go read the original um re read read the, the john carter stories read the pellucidar stories um um yeah and that's the other the other thing uh, is go out and run your own role-playing game and don't run uh just a one shot sit down and buy yourself arbiter of worlds by alexander macris and he'll 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 tell you uh really step by step how to go about and build your own sandbox campaign um and it's it's a great resource and find a group get together with people don't be afraid don't be isolated don't be atomized in your home go out and find people and play and don't and don't just don't play the um you know the 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 prepackaged you can take the modules and integrate them right but don't only play stuff that's put out by that was written in the last five years by by hasbro and don't uh, do 5e or, do osr <laughs> You can do five E if yeah. If so, some people really like five E and they they like, nope, they, like their, they like their characters. <laughs> they like their characters being superheroes when they come out. But trick them in, push them in, and then just slowly change bit by bit. And yeah, get, get get rid of those rests. BX are broke, man. But if if you are looking for um, uh, a really uh, a, a, a almost never ending fountain of creativity from the independent side, there is so much of that in role-playing games, uh, particularly in the OSR, but, and also in the, the, uh, Cepheus system, um, all, all the, uh, there, there's a lot of open source stuff there and, and anybody, everybody who's just putting out their own, uh, their, some of their, their own campaigns, their own backgrounds and settings. It's really, there's really terrific material on it. So there's plenty of that. You can find them on, um, uh, maybe, at, maybe at your local game store, um, probably more likely on on uh, um, drive through RPG. So go out and check it out. There, there's a, there's a ton of that. And of, of course, I'll mention our, our Essentially Epoch books um, in which we have both uh, role-playing game books, our most recently released Kickstarter um, for Dauntless, the, the, the heroic adventure zine, and also for um, our illustrated novels and short story collections. And we have another one coming out pretty soon that we're going to launch on Kickstarter. It'll be part two in our Martian War Chronicles series. So um, we'll keep you posted on this. And also, uh, I want to say that I, I enjoy this format very much. And I think that there is probably a demand for having something like this recurring, where, uh, particularly where we want to, uh, maybe where we do the deep dives and reviews of some independent work. Uh, maybe we can get some of the art, the authors and artists on here and talk, talk to them directly, or we could just, you know, whatever, whatever you guys find. Um, and, 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 you know, tell people about it, why you liked it. We'll show, show some um, screenshots if we can. And, um, and, and really, cause I, I think it's important that we promote uh, independent creators have a hard time getting marketing out there, getting people to see it. So um, we don't have a, a huge audience, but we do have a, we do have an audience of uh, people that are, are hungry for this stuff. So let's, let's get that food out there to them. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm come chiefly at most things from, from gaming. So uh, I know that's a niche of a niche, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I uh, want to be a stronger voice in the gaming community for lifting up the good, uh, uh, that's out there and um yeah there's a lot of a lot of examples and like i say i've sifted <laughs> i've sifted the catalog so i now know how to <laughs> how to spot the good from the bad and and i'll help people thump melons if they so desire all right everybody and everybody watching at home thank you very much for for listening and we hope you'll join us again and hopefully what will be a a regular uh, event on attention span labs the the appendix i live stream Thank you very much. And uh, you guys have anything final to say before we sign off? Uh, just that I have scientifically tested the first issue of Dauntless and found not even trace amounts of Daunt. So <laughs> it is exactly what it says on it the was not less. Thank you very much. I wanted right, to mention, yeah. again, the, the Fourth Age, RJ at the Fourth Age, awesome YouTube channel, and he is doing a uh, an independent comic, so you should check it out. It's hashtag Thomas Valiant, one word. Uh, I don't have anything other than uh, Frankenstein is coming out, Adam Frankenstein. Um, you can see my icon is uh, basically from the cover. Um, 
looking forward to seeing more of everybody. All right, uh, guys, uh, you send me the links to everything you want to share, and I'll put them in the in the description of the video. And with that said, uh, thanks for watching. You guys have a happy Thanksgiving, and hopefully we'll talk to you in, in the very near future. Have a good night. Good night.